Hey everybody, Anthony 4 before diesel I don't want to sell products for towing, but you can't lie about the trip stats. Uh, an hour and a half towing a two-ton scissor lift, 13.3 litres per 100 k's, and it does it easy. In this video, I'm going to have all the information you need to help you make a decision whether you should purchase a Prado to tow or not. And there's the uh, scissor lift. I don't know. Well, you tell me what it weighs. I don't know, but across Melbourne, um, Caroline Springs to Cranbourne. A quick video stat for the people that don't know. 2022 Prado, one year old, 31 odd thousand kilometres. For the people that want to know, this is a scan gauge three. Gives us a lot of data and information we need. And the trip computer on after start tells us what the fuel economy is on that trip. It's the 1GD FTV, January 2022. So just over 12 months old, six speed auto. It's got no bull bar and it's got BFG KO2 tires in the standard size. It has got a Dobinson's lift kit. It's got the IMS with the Dobinson springs. It has got the roller Titan tray with the ridge mount mounting system, a shovel and an awning on the other side. It's a GX, but it's got a storage system in the back to make up for the weight saved from the seven seater and a Heyman Reese tow bar. It's also got the rear table, so a bit of added weight in the back. But what this video is about, is this a towing machine? So I could have called this the 30,000 kilometer re review. I could have called it why the transmission gets hot sometimes unexplained i could call it why the egt temperatures go up why the coolant temps go up but first thing i want to cover is is the remapped 2022 prado a tow machine now when i say remapped that's my slang you know for in 2020 sometime i'm not going to say the exact month or year because i could be wrong but basically where they did the bigger turbo they did the remap that's the biggest changes really at the end of the day it's basically the same engine a uh, few little tweaks here and there. They can give you write-ups about it. At the end of the day, it's the same engine. It's got a bigger turbo. It's been remapped, and that's that. But the an question to the answer, answer to the question, whichever way you want to look at it, is short answer is yes, it is. And I'll tell you why, and then I'll answer those other questions for you, why these things are happening, because they are things to be aware of and try and avoid them, or maybe this vehicle is not going to suit you. So by the end of the video, we'll try and wrap it up in about 10 minutes. Hopefully, you'll have the answer so it helps you make a decision whether you want to invest in a Prado, a 300 series or a 200 series or whatever, to get right into all that stuff, we might have to go beyond 10 minutes, but the most important part in the first 10 minutes, so short answer, yes, it's an absolutely awesome tow machine. And this is why, because it's actually got really good torque and it's got really good transmission torque converter lock, right? It gets torque converter lock in third, fourth, fifth and sixth, and it holds it really well, okay? I mean, I couldn't have done a better job myself. So for towing, once you're up on the open road, happy days. Now it gets there okay. It's not a race machine. It's not a V8 or a V6. It's not going to do zero to uh, zero to ten seconds in uh, zero to 110 seconds towing a caravan. Okay, but it gets there fairly rapidly. Given it's a 2755cc diesel engine, it gets there very well. Now I'm not towing a big caravan three ton, and I don't recommend that. For, for a lot of reasons, but we'll get into that probably in other videos. Check our other videos, our playlists. Um, you've got to be reasonable. And I've got to tell you, this vehicle probably weighs, you know, loaded with a you know, few people and some gear in the car. Probably getting close to three tonne like most Prados, but at the moment it's probably more like two, two and a half empty GX with a bit of gear added. Um, but once you put a few things in and a family or stuff like that, you're close enough to three tonne. Therefore, in my opinion, it'd be crazy to be having another three tonne on the back that's pretty much out of control. But that's a whole separate video. Now, the advantage of a 300 series, firstly, it's got a disadvantage. If it was a, the disadvantage of a 300 series is you can buy two or three Pradas for a 300 series. So in my opinion, there's no value at all whatsoever. Everybody loves their Prados. The thing drives great. It gets awesome economy in those lower speeds once it's warmed up. You can really baby it and get six, seven, eight, nine litres per 100 k's. But you've got to understand those short trips with the cold engine, you're not going to see that. So if you're just doing a kilometre school and back, that's more about fuel economy. We're not going to talk about that. But what I really wanted to say is once you're up to speed, it will maintain speeds of 100, 110 going uphill. So easy, it's not funny, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, there's hills and there's hills, but today we travelled from Caroline Springs side of town out to Cranbourne side of town to drop off that scissor lift. And, um, you know, it's a two-ton scissor lift trailer. 
Uh, from towing other things, I would estimate we're getting pretty close to two ton. Can anyone put it in the comments? I said it earlier. Let us know what does the scissor lift weigh? I didn't look it up. I'm going to take a guess that it's well over a ton and the trailer's probably at least quite a few hundred kilos, getting close to 500, maybe three or 400, maybe something like that. So one way or another, I believe it's getting close to three. You know, you've got the batteries and everything in there as well. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing. Now, I've towed other things before that weigh similar sort of weights um, with the 120 and with other Prados, Hiluxes, manuals and all that sort of thing. And you can certainly notice the difference between a Prado and a Hilux with the 1KD because of that torque. Now, this is a massive difference again because the Hilux is about, ballpark figures, about the 350, 360 newton metres of torque. The, the Prado 120, 150, the 1KD is about 4, 410, the ones in Australia. And this thing here in front of us is remapped to 500 newton metres of torque. So it's a massive difference. And that's why it's actually really good. I'm not concerned about the transmission at all. It, like I said, it selects gears well. You, better off you do it. Use the fourth gear towing thing. Downhills, you can slip it into fifth. I wouldn't worry about sixth. I wouldn't leave it in drive, but you can if you want. And there's reasons for that. We'll talk about the EGTs and the coolant temps and stuff like that in a moment. And the trans temp, why does it go up if you've got the torque converter locked? And pretty well, it seems obvious. Wouldn't it seem obvious to you? But, you know, it's all to do with heat and it's connected to the engine and the heat from the engine because the smaller the engine, the more it's going to work. So as much as it does the job, is it a tow vehicle? Yes, it is. Look, far as I'm concerned for most people that do, uh, I don't know how many trips you, you got to get left to go around, trips around Australia and traveling and all that sort of thing. I don't know how many you've got left, to be quite honest, but that's another story. Um, most people are doing a trip once a year or once in a lifetime or you know a couple of times a year a couple of weeks at a time so if you're going to go and specifically buy a vehicle like a 300 series and spend 150 grand for a gr sport or whatever it is and wait years for it or whatever it is for diesels that they want to you know they're, they're on the way out you've invested a lot of money so i hope you're loaded and Basically, what's going to happen is you're probably going to get about the same fuel economy, to be honest. I mean, you saw what we got. It was the computer set about 13 odd for the trip, right? Now, that was a mix of highway driving speeds at 100, 105, that sort of thing, you know. And, of course, we went through that bike ride. What is it? Ride for the kids or whatever. Through we Just on purpose to go past, have a look, see what's going on. We're in quite a lot of stop-start traffic for at least 20 minutes, half an hour as well. So that is the average fuel economy from the higher speed driving and also that slower sitting in traffic. So I'm really impressed with uh, what it got fuel economy wise. Of course, if you've got a headwind, um, other conditions, heat and that sort of thing, you don't expect to get that sort of economy all the time. And if you've got a caravan, it's got a lot more wind resistance. So don't expect to get that either. So hope you hung around for this talk because if you didn't, this is why you need to hang around because, oh, you didn't think of that. The weight is something that it, it requires power to get you going and get you up to speed. And once you're up to speed, when you come to hills, torque's what you need to maintain speed. That's what torque is, to put it in simple terms. And wind resistance is what costs you full fuel at speed because it's, think of you, the vehicle's already a brick, so to speak, you know, um, with a caravan behind it. Have you ever noticed, you look at these little vehicles, the little BT50 and this massive caravan coming at you. It's heaps wider than the vehicle. It's heaps taller. It's heaps longer. It's just ridiculous, okay? It doesn't make any sense to me, um, but I'm going to do it. I've told you in other videos, I'm going to do it just to be like, if everyone else is going to do it, I re do as I say, not as I do. I recommend against it. Get the smallest possible caravan. You want to keep your weight as close as possible to about two ton. If you've got a vehicle like a Prado, let's say a three ton vehicle, should be able to tow about two ton. It's definitely not as safe as not towing, okay? It's definitely, towing is a dangerous thing. You've got massively reduced braking distance. You've got massively reduced maneuverability. I mean massive. It's not just, oh, you can't quite do that. It's like, no, you can't do anything. You are basically, think about your steering being locked and you can't turn it. That's pretty much the way you've got to think of it. You try and avoid something, do the wrong thing at the wrong time. If your reaction plays tricks on you and you do what you do when you're not towing, you'd be in a world of pain and suffering, okay? Because the caravan, you'll be looking at it at your side window and it's all over from there. Smoke and mirror, see you later, right? So be aware, towing is very dangerous, okay? You need to really think about it. Now, the 200 series, you know, I'm being told, oh, mate, we need to get a 200 series, need a V8. Well, to be quite honest, there was a 200 series next to us at one stage and all I heard was... Yeah, he was towing some small, was it a generator or something like that? And I was thinking, look at all that noise, and we're going up over the Westgate Bridge, 
and I go, mate, well, let's see, we're in fourth to convert a locked, towing this two ton thing, and I just squeeze the accelerator a bit, and oh, we're, you know, we're building speed, torque converter locked in fourth gear. That's what I'm saying. Yes, it is an awesome towing machine. I wouldn't invest any money on anything any more expensive like a 300 series. What, you know, what, you got money to burn, I suppose. If you got money to burn, that's why you do it, just because you can, right? Just because you can. But then, because you can, why don't you just get a Prado and help out someone less fortunate? Because that's probably a better idea rather than just blowing money on a 300 series, right? So anyone less fortunate, put it in the comments. Let, let us all know how less fortunate you are because there is people out there that will help people that are less fortunate. So if you don't mind, uh, show yourselves, let us know who it is and subscribe and turn the bell on because there could be some help for you and let us know when you need help and we'll do what we can to help. Okay, so there's a few other questions we just want to finish up with and that is, so coolant temp. Obviously coolant temp can go up quickly um, when you load up there. So let me put it simple. The smaller the engine, the harder the engine's got to work with fueling and the mapping to get the power and to get the torque, right? So the bigger it is, you know the saying, there's no replacement for cubic displacement. Well, that's the case, right? So if you haven't got the cubic displacement, you need to replace it with some efficiency. So make the engine a bit more efficient, that sort of thing, that's good. But basically fuel and to make fuel means bigger bang, bigger explosions, more power, more torque, more force on the piston, more heat. So you're gonna get your coolant temperatures, this thing, the coolant certainly gets hotter a lot quicker than any of the 1KDs I drive, um, towing, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's just towing, to be quite honest, towing a scissor lift. Without the wind drag, I've towed boats, um, distances, you know, for hours with the 120. And, you know, I've never seen coolant temperatures above about 90 degrees in doing so. And, of course, you take the boat on a nice sunny day, probably just as warm or warmer than it was towing the scissor lift. So there you go. And it comes up rapidly. It only takes about a minute of a decent uphill run to get the coolant temp to 95. So the coolant's getting up there quickly. Now, people ask, so EGTs. You can see that on the scan gauge three, but you don't need an EGT gauge or anything like that. You can just look at the coolant temp and know that if the coolant's up, the EGTs are up. You're working the engine, the EGTs are up. It's as simple as that. You might not know you're working it with this one because it's, like I said, it's the mapping. It's got the torque. It's pumping the fuel in the right amounts at the right time, okay? Um, that's exactly what's making the torque, okay? So basically what you're doing is it's it's you're putting it under... Um, how, what's the word? You're putting under pressure, you, you're creating load, torque, pressure, heat, kind of without knowing it, right? So the lower the revs are, the more load there is and the more heat it creates. So that's why by dropping it back again, that's why they say tow in fourth. If you're on the flat and you've got a heavy caravan, you better be in fourth in the five, sp uh, in the five speed, the six speed, and in one to one gearing, that's third in the four speed autos, like in the Hiluxes and the earlier Protos, that sort of thing. Okay, last one is, there's a weird one going on transmission temps okay so if you've got the earlier one gd i've explained this check out our playlist there's one there automatic transmission but i'll just briefly go through it because this one does throw you a little bit so it's pretty simple right you keep the torque converter locked there's nothing making heat in the transmission other than the transmission lines coming up through the radiator to warm it up because they want it to normal operating temperature right normal like the coolant right? They want 83, 75 to 90 is normal. So they want 83. They run the transmission through the coolant because they want what? Yeah, about 70, 80, 90 degrees, somewhere in there will be fine. So that's what's happening. So the way this transmission, because it's locked, it's locked, it's locked. They actually want it to warm up because they don't lock the torque converter until it reaches about 39, 40 degrees on the transmission temp. I'm not talking about temp, pan temp, um, torque converter temps, I'm talking about pan temps. When it hits about 40 degrees, that's when the torque converter will start locking up. So they actually want to get it to 40 ASAP. They don't want it running around cold. So cold's not good. So keep that in mind with your older vehicles, maybe your 1KDs, maybe it doesn't have that software where they keep it unlocked till it warms up. And if you've got a cooler, you're running around with a cold transmission all the time, you're going to reduce the life of the transmission because if it didn't, they wouldn't bother putting it in the software to make it, you know, not lock to make it warm up, right? So they're running it through the coolant. If they didn't want it warm, they wouldn't run it through the coolant and the radiator, would they? Obvious stuff. It's all just, what I'm talking about here, people, it's common sense. It's uncommon sense, but it's so simple. That's why you subscribe, listen, turn the bell on, and you just your common sense will come back to you and you'll be able to figure all this stuff out without listening to me. But as I keep saying, gather the information while you can, because it might not always be available. So... Why is the transmission keep getting hotter? Because in the 1KD with the 5-speed, you know, you lock the torque converter in fourth and then you see the temp steady off at, you know, 70, 80. Depends what your climate is. Depends 
what guards you've got underneath your transmission blocking the air cooling. Depends what bull bars, winches, and lights you've got on the front stopping the cooling at the front. So you get all these variables, but generally you get the torque converter locked and you watch the temps come down. You slip the torque converter, you watch the temps go up. It's as simple as that. So with this thing, it stays locked so well. Since it was remapped, the transmission was remapped at the same date as the engine when the bigger turbo was put on. And if for people that want to, I'm going to give you a, at the end of the video, if I don't forget, I'm going to show you how to tell whether you've got the remap version. We're going to go over here and look at the turbo. And basically you're looking at these clamps here is the easy way to tell. I'll, I'll just say it in case I forget. Instead of having the normal worm drive clamps here on the turbo hose that goes to the intercooler, you've got a, I don't even know what you call it. It's a new generation stainless steel Toyota quality clamp. And if you see that, okay, if you see that like that, and I'll try and remember to show you it then, we'll just whip the camera over there. That is the remap version. You drive it, you'll know. I'll tell you now, chalk and cheese. So let's just quickly say the old 1GD, 2015 to 20, ballpark numbers. The transmission software was terrible, absolutely terrible. Torque converter, you know, you're driving along, 100K, slightest hill, unlock, back to fifth, stays unlock, whatever, you know, aggressively back to fourth. And torque converter was even, you could get it locked in fourth, but hard to get locked, right? And it wasn't even working that hard. It was just hopeless software, to be quite honest. And therefore, we constantly saw transmission temps easily going up, up, up. You could watch it go up. It's in our videos. Again, transmission playlist. And the highest we saw was 117. And by then, there must have been something in the software that said, no, nah, once we get to there, let's lock it up at a, at, a, at, full, at a lower load conditions or whatever the case may be, rather than waiting for, you know, what it, you know what I mean? You know, lock up easier, basically. So this is what I believe. This is just what I'm surmised because I kept seeing 117 and then it would lock up and cool down and then it would get... But anyway, then you watch the video at 60,000 Ks where we took a sample of that oil to show you it's not panic stations, it's still in pretty good condition at 60,000, even with all those 117 temps that many times. So my point is if you look after it, keep it cool, don't let it get to 117, which was avoidable by looking on the scan gauge, scan gauge tool, do it, scan gauge three, whatever you want, whatever product you like, you keep the transmission cool, you don't need to worry about it because you can keep it locked, you can, ma it's just a lot of work managing it. This one you don't have to manage, right? You could keep it at a reasonable temperature. Now, with this one, this is crazy. This one, GG, they even get hotter than the old one with the torque converter lock. They get hotter. So what's going on? Okay, so we've got the torque converter locked. We've got the air cooling on the pan, stock standard bash plates underneath it. So we've got the perfectly normal air cooling. We've got the normal plastic bumper bar. There's no modifications underneath other than that slight sort of 40 mil, 50 mil lift. Um, you know, dual battery system, there's a compressor, a roof rack, this sort of thing. So it's all underneath, it's fairly standard. It is standard underneath. Some rear shock guards for the rear shockers for the monotubes. You know, the K-On shock guards for the Dobinson's IMS. Right, so you've got an engine cruising along at, say, uh, 85 degrees coolant temp, you're doing 100 Ks, right? And, and it takes a long time for the transmission to warm up because, you know, obviously it's locked, it's locked. The transmission back here, it's locked, it's locked, it's locked for ages, it's just locked stays locked really well you're not going to cook your transmission oil but what happens is okay so the only thing that makes heat remember is the torque converter slipping is the big thing that makes heat it's not slipping we've got it running through the coolant okay but the coolant's only 85 well it depends which side of the radio let's not get too technical though all right so what's the only other thing that can make heat can someone put it in the comments because nobody knows and I'm not even 100%, but the only thing that I believe can make heat is, as we already discussed, this little engine, 2755cc, hauling five or six tonne up those hills, it's working hard. We know the corn's getting top, hot. It's making heat. That little engine's going to be hot. You're going to be able to fry eggs on the block. Do you know what I mean? So what I'm saying must be happening. It's the only thing left that can happen. It's either the heat from the exhaust on the transmission lines, right or a combination of that and the heat from the engine transferring through all those metals through the bell housing to the transmission okay that's the only thing left there's no torque converter slip there's no change in cooling at the front the harder you work so if you drive around at 80 90 k's hey she'll be sitting sweet you watch it come down it'll sit just about what the coolant temperature is you know 85 80 85 whatever it is right it'll sit about there but if you've got a hot day and you've got a hot engine and you're working hard, you're traveling at 100, 110, 120, 130, you're gonna see temperatures at least 90 degrees on your trans temps quite common. If you watch my videos in the trans playlist or talking about fuel economy playlist and you see those figures on the scan gauge three there, which is supplied by AZ Scanners, of course, because they're one of the leading uh, scan 
you know, scan tools, diagnostic tools and all that sort of thing in Australia. So, you know, customer service wise. So that's where we're getting our gear from. Um, they're also supporting us with um, a couple of freebies and that for some uh, things. So you just stay tuned on all the channels and pages and you'll know what I'm talking about. So point is, that's all it can be. So I don't know categorically, but there's no other reason the transmission can make heat. Um, I've had a look around and I've gone, okay, I can see they put some insulation there from the transmission or the exhaust and that. I can't remember, I'm not under there now, to maybe block some heat to the transmission. There's like a guard on the side. Uh, it's obviously not doing enough. So heat from the exhaust and right behind the DPF, we're talking, right? So there's some heat going on there between the DPF, the heat from the engine, all of this stuff, pumping the heat to the transmission, that's the only thing it can be. So the more you slow down, the cooler the engine and the exhaust and everything, the more the transmission will cool from the air cooling from the pan on the transmission, the faster you drive, cause the engine's making that heat, it's making heat in the exhaust, it's transferring to either the lines or a combination of that. So I've been really clear explaining it once again, like always, haven't I? So I hope that explains a lot of things for you. Um, I'll continue to keep looking around and I'll check the comments, every single comment on this video. And bada bing, bada boom, that's the deal. If you've got any other ideas, you can put it in the comments, but um, I'll tell you already, don't think too hard about it because I've already done that. And um, yeah, bit of a waste of time. There's nothing else. What makes heat in the transmission is warming it up through the radiator and torque converter slipping. That is it, okay? So we've got no torque converter slipping, so it's engine load. So what you'll probably find is the higher gear you drive in, the higher your transmission temps will be as well. So someone can confirm this because heaps of people have got the 1GD. Let's see how many waited to, to 20 minutes in the video. I know I told you'd have to go longer because we've got a lot to talk about. We've got a lot of education. We've got a lot of things to get people um, thinking about and um, come up with some resolutions and answers to some questions. So if you've got a 1GD, have you noticed that? And if you haven't noticed anything yet, start taking notice. Let me know in the comments. Would you agree that if you drive in fourth, like they say tow in fourth, would you agree that the transmission stays much cooler than if you, when you're towing, I know you've done it, just like I do. You know, they tell you what to do, but you know, you can do whatever you want. It's not a big problem having it go to 90, 95, 100. I see it go to about 100. That's about the limit I've seen on this one. That's what I'm saying, because it's not from the torque converter slipping. It's from the heat of the transmission. It's always at highway speed. It's always on hot days or it's always towing. That's where you get the higher trans temps. So would you agree that? Sixth, it's going to get hot. Fifth, it's going to get hot. You drop it back to fourth. EGTs come down. Coolant comes down. And of course, that trans temp will come down because the engine's got less heat. That's what you're seeing at the transmission, right? So that's what it is. I'm 99.99999, but let's just get some of the comments. Everybody else can have a look as well. And in case you didn't know, all the comments on this YouTube channel, in the... Uh, idea of trying to keep it clean no swearing thank you very much and every now and then one will slip through because i don't read the whole thing but generally i read all the comments and they'll all be approved but if they're swearing and that they might be deleted and then you wasted your time sorry about that so don't don't keep trying to reply again and again and again because i see that sometimes which is why i mention it now all the comments need to be approved so yeah you just need to wait patiently and usually they're approved pretty quickly um and same thing on our facebook groups and all that please no swearing there's a bunch of admins that take care of it and you know you might just get deleted off the group your post might you go to all this effort of writing a post putting the photos and all that and then it just gets deleted because uh you had to put swearing in there you know they've got to decline it sort of thing so um if you're wondering why just have another read of it and go oh wonder why that didn't get approved if it didn't get approved have a look at it if they're swearing um, there's no need for any personal attacks. Everyone can just be nice to each other, try and help each other out. That's what it's all about. I talk to people all the time. Ah, oh, Facebook, you know, Facebook. You know what, a lot of you might not be on Facebook. I've even got people that go, oh, I don't do YouTube, you know. It's quite funny, actually. It's like saying, oh, I don't go to Bunnings. Oh, I hate going to Bunnings. I hate it. Oh, why do you hate it? Oh, because there's always traffic at school time. You know, hello, I mean, use a different road or go at a different time. It's Bunnings, mate. You go to Bunnings, you buy your, uh, what are you buying at Bunnings, mate? You know what I mean? You're probably buying another trigger sprayer for your hose because someone dropped it and it cracked. Or, you know, those spray bottles, you mix your stuff and whatever because they deteriorate and crack. Or someone drops it and it cracks or you pump it up and it explodes like we had one do the other day. I'll show you that actually. Check that out. Could you imagine pumping this up and boof. Getting covered in a uh, degreaser. Not good, is it, right? So anyway, that's what happened. Anyway, that's another story, but a bit of entertainment for those people hung around. But you get what I'm saying? It's a platform, 
right? So you can't say, oh, I hate Facebook because what you've seen on other people's Facebook and what they talk about, that's a different world to what we're talking about here. You join Facebook, you, you call yourself whatever your name is, Mitch Hilux, and you put a picture of your Hilux from the side of it or something like that, then there's no Rego, there's no you, it's not about you. People just go, this guy's got a Hilux, his name's Mitch. He's just there for the info. And you join our groups only, you know, on that page. Let's do it again. Let me try and here. We've got it here for us. Let me just show you the groups, right? If you're in Australia, it's Oz Hilux Crew and Oz Prado Crew, right? At the top there. If you're not in Australia, it's any of these other groups basically in the picture now, right? So you can pause that and have a look later. If you're a client VIP group at the top here, right? And this is the, to do with the gold class. People that have made contributions for worst case scenario. And of course, the two most important YouTube channels on YouTube at the bottom there, 4 before Diesel, 4 before Adventures. And if you do need parts, kits, injectors for your 1KD, um, the Proto Hospital page, uh, text message, there's the number. Monday morning, 7.30 a.m. It's a text message service only. It's not a phone call. Uh, too busy for phone calls. So I've only got time to make videos because I just shared this information with thousands of people where if I talked on the phone about it, I'm just going to waste my time because I have to do it a thousand times, right? Get it? And then we've got all these other topics. That's why I started doing videos. It makes more time. It multiplies my time. So if you've hung around to the end 24 minutes, I'll be looking forward to your comments about that. I think we pretty much nailed it here. So... I'm just gonna wrap it up by saying it again. I know I repeat myself, but I just wanna be really clear and I'd rather be clear and have people complain about rambling than, uh, than not be clear and have questions. Cause that's what happens if you're not clear, you got questions, okay? So personally, I would never own, sorry to the people that own these vehicles. Personally, I'd never own a 2015 to 2020 uh, 1GD again. Um, the engine seems gutless. The transmission software is hopeless. It's always slipping. That's enough just to annoy me and get me out of the picture. Then you've got the factor that possible DPF issues, um, timing chain problems. Let's not even go there. There's a heap of problems that they have as well. So I don't think you got one, you're bulletproof. I said 1KD lasted the best. I still stick to that. Eventually there will be, I think, a better vehicle and a better engine, or there'll be no more vehicles and no more engines, depending on you know, what you want to believe and if your head's in the sand or not. Things are happening, big things are happening. Anyway, so um, there's your engine. That's your 1KD. If you need a tow vehicle um, or you're thinking about contemplating whatever, um, again, be careful investing a lot of money into new diesels because you know they do want to get rid of them one way or the other. So eventually the way to do it, the fuel might just stop. And there's big things that can happen, three letters that stop fuel and stop everything. And that could be a big problem. So if you waited to the end, Hope you're prepared for that. Then again, don't worry about it. Who cares? Whatever happens, happens. Whatever you want. Just enjoy each day. Have a good time. Thanks for listening. Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, mate, I reckon it's a great tow vehicle, right? So, yeah, the 120 tow is good. You put it in fourth, it locks up. But this thing, it stays locked better in fourth. And it stays locked better in fifth, right, than the five-seat auto. So, as far as the auto and the software goes, the 1GD 2020 onwards is better the torque is better, but of course, this vehicle only gets used for long trips. We're not going to risk it with a DPF. Every now and then, we'll do some short trips to do a bit of R&D, tell you stuff, show you some weird things that it's doing. But generally, it only does long trips, minimum 50 k's, even longer, big days out, big trips. Um, we've got other vehicles for the shorter trips. The 1KDs can handle that, no problem. Don't be too worried about your 1KD doing short trips. If it's all clean, and you've got the injectors done, you've got your plate in, reduce flow and all that, beautiful. And what you can do then is regularly run the vehicle. I'd rather you drive it 10 k's a day than just park it thinking, oh, I don't want to drive it short trips. You know what I mean? At least drive the thing at least a couple of times a week. Um, don't leave them sitting around, please, guys. That's not the best thing for anything on the vehicle. Regular use, drive the bloody thing, okay? I've yacked enough, haven't I? That's got to be a Sunday night special. If you made it to the end, just write Sunday night special in the comment. If you've got any other um, information, please let me know. Thanks. See ya. Ciao. I really forgot, didn't I, about that. You know, see the clamp on the turbo? If you've got those clamps, what else can I tell you? It's, you know, to pick it up here, it looks the same. It's the same engine. You're going to look at everything. Look, uh, I don't look at that many of them to try and work it out, but I can tell you they changed those clamps. And from my experience, can anyone also confirm that waited till the end in the comments? The new generation Toyota stainless steel specials, whatever you want to call them, clamps. The older one, GD, it's got the normal sort of worm drive clamps. I'm pretty sure from memory it's been a while. Not even these ones. 
you know, those other ones like what they've got on the 1KDs. So I really love these clamps, by the way. So they do look a lot neater, and they're certainly going to stay there, and they clip on and off much easier as well, I believe. But I've never taken one off, so happy days, and hopefully it stays that way. No, this has not got a plate in it, but that's where it goes down there, the 13 mil. A lot of people use that successfully. Some people have some issues. I won't be keeping this that long that it matters, so I hope you know my position on it. I'm not telling you everybody should do as I say, not as I do. Listen to one word again. 1KD, last of the best. All right, got to go. See you.